Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I'm really happy to introduce to you uh, Louis Philippe Morsi today as our last speaker, and I'm really glad that he agreed to give a talk today. Um, uh, so just to quickly introduce him, he got his master's uh, and PhD at MIT at the um, Computer Science and AI Laboratory. And then after that, he worked as a research assistant professor at the University of Southern California, also at the Computer Science Department. And then he moved to, uh, to the CMU, so to Pittsburgh, I guess. And um, there he is an assistant professor in the Language Technology Institute now, where he works on multimodal learning, which is also the topic that he will talk about today. And I'm really looking forward to your talk. Okay. Yes, thank you uh, very much for having me. Um, uh, even though it's uh, virtual, I think we by now got used to this uh, virtual representation. Um, so if you have any question, please feel free. Probably it will be easier to have most of the questions at the end, but if there's any clarification, let me know. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, multimodal, which I think is also a topic important in, the, in, your, in the next Gen AI uh, event, is a topic I generally uh, love very much. Um, and uh, so I will uh, hope to share with you my passion for multimodal and also try to give you um, uh, and, uh, some uh, highlight of the, what I believe are core issues uh, for research in this field. Um, so my research group is at uh, Carnegie Mellon, the Multicomp Lab. As you also know, when a professor presents his work, it's often the work of the students. I'm very proud of, of their uh, research. Um, we do in my lab a work on multimodal AI, on human uh, and effective computing, and also on mental health. I will focus today primarily on the multimodal learning. Uh, in fact, we, we live in a world where uh, uh, multimodal is, is part, it has already always part of our day to day because we have been interacting with other uh, either human or uh, people or animals even um, in a multimodal way, but now technologies are becoming multimodal. In fact, we spent the last two years on those video conferencing, uh, which are in itself audio and visual. Uh, so when we communicate, a lot of these are through those three V of communication. These are three of the important modality. The verbal, which is the, what you say, the language, the vocal, and then the visual. Um, which is the facial expression. So uh, a lot of it in the language is the choice of the words you make, how you phrase your sentences, but also the intent behind the words, which often will be part of what's called pragmatics. Um, so this is the verbal, the vocal is through your prosody, what emphasis you give but also these intonation and acoustic features that are outside the words, like laughter, uh, pulse fillers, and uh, moaning, um, as to example. The visual side, uh, myself was originally a computer vision before uh, now working on multimodal. So the visual side with the hand gestures, uh, eye and head gestures, it, the body language, is another where uh, proximic is in fact uh, how close you are to someone, but this, this is kind of losing some of it in the virtual world, uh, although they're trying to recreate that. And eye contact, in fact, one of the first few I often uh, study when we look at communication face-to-face -face is eye contact, both from a communicative channel, but also as a way to show cognitive loads and other cues like this, and definitely facial expressions as we know really well. So multimodal AI, one of the important aspects of it is multimodal perception. How do you integrate all of these modalities, these very heterogeneous modalities with different structure, temporal structures, but also different type of noise and different type of information encoded there. So all of the above, 
brings together uh, with the goal eventually maybe to recognize emotions, social signal, even maybe mental health. So this topic uh, requires, and I believe strongly requires research that goes a little bit beyond like conventional machine learning. And to do this, we um, uh, propose a taxonomy uh, a few years ago uh, about what are the core challenges in multimodal learning that are that are understudied in other fields. Doesn't mean they have never been studied, but are probably understudied. And I will try to give you uh, more details about it uh, today, at least on three of them. Um, if you are interested to read more, there, there's a paper that was written, a survey, perfect things if you need to, uh, a way, uh, easy way to fall asleep uh, tonight, that's a perfect uh, turn pager for you. But also if you're really interested on this topic, there's 15, plus lectures uh, on this uh, on YouTube. Um, so yeah, two of the core challenges when you look at few, uh, multimodal is, is the goal to integrate the information uh, from all these modalities, or are you there mostly to translate from one to the other? These are two of the fundamental challenges and to build on top for both of them, you require the representations, how you integrate the representation, but also how you align uh, these modalities together. In fact, I believe alignment is one of the key technical challenge in many cases, because you have elements in each modalities like object in an image or words in a sentence and knowing which word relate to which object is an example of alignment. And there's also what's called co-learning, which is the idea of how one modality could help another. So today I will focus on three of them, uh, representation, alignment, and fusion. Um, but I also want to emphasize another aspect is that a really big shift in multimodal learning, and I would argue probably in machine learning in general in the last five plus years, is to go a little bit uh, closer to the real world AI applications because AI is suddenly and machine learning are suddenly working, then a lot of these other uh, challenges beyond just uh, the modeling itself start uh, popping up. And I think we need to make them and think about them. So when we think of multimodal AI, we should not just think of those five technical challenges, we should also think about what is the challenges or are the challenges in the real world. So for example, efficiency will be one of them like computation, memory, all of the above robustness. A lot of time you will have occlusion, uh, you have noise and so how to robust to that. And one aspect that really needs a lot more thought and research is trust uh, related also to fairness. Uh, and going beyond like in the lab kind of setting, you want to be able to generalize, also generalize beyond language and vision. There are a lot of other modalities, for example, phone will have a lot more and you need to be aware of privacy uh, and that becomes important and we have to applaud uh, Europe to be uh, a, a strong uh, proponent of, of in this direction. So again, I will focus on three core technical challenges and a little bit more on three of the real world challenges today. So the first one is about multimodal representation, learning how to represent and summarize multimodal data in a way that you exploit the redundancy and the complementarity. So if you have three visual, uh, uh, three modalities, how can you learn this joint representation? Uh, and there's been quite a lot of work in the past uh, looking at this, and that's very exciting. Uh, the classic, what I would probably find the classic approach, uh, or one older, maybe older approach, uh, was to learn in a more generative models these uh, joint representation. That was the early one. What became about maybe four or five years ago, very popular was the autoencoder, including its extension of version of autoencoder, where you have both an encoder and a decoder to learn this representation. Um, there is also a supervised way to do it where 
you directly learn the representation in such a way that it best predict your labels. These are three examples of, uh, of these paradigms. And, but I want to emphasize one thing is then when you look at these, you have to be aware that we have three modalities and these three modalities couldn't interact in different ways. First, within each modality, you have a structure like language as a structure. Uh, differently, you see it also in other modalities, but modalities sometimes interact with each other. Language and vision is a very well studied example of that and sometimes not often but uh quite important when they happen is the trimodal case where a cue can best be interpreted when seen from all three modalities together and to really explain this a little bit more it's sometimes useful to have an example so if i want to predict sentiment sentiment is like either positive or negative it's an opinion as you like to know how positive or negative if you just look at one individual behavior like the person saying this movie is sick at least in the u.s sick could be interpreted both way it could be good or bad uh this movie is fair it's probably either neutral or maybe a little bit positive a smile maybe a little bit positive these are unimodal cues and sometimes unimodal cues by itself are not informative, like a loud voice. You could be loud because you're excited positively or you're very angry and negative. And then the bimodal was like the movie is sick, but you smile. Or your movie is sick and you frown. These probably mean that you uh, suddenly this ambiguity with language got resolved. But this movie is sick and you're loud, still ambiguous. Now, Let's go finally with the third trimodal. This movie is sick, you smile and you're loud, probably very, very positive. But, and that's really what, what makes multimodal more interesting is that this movie is fair. Even if you smile, you're loud, there are fireworks in the background, it's still ambiguous and the, 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 the language takes over the other modality. And that's an example of what's called a nonlinearity, meaning that it's not just additive, you're not just adding more and more of the same old, uh, same uh, cues and evidences from different modalities. Multimodal often requires uh, and uh, has these nonlinearity. To help model these not different nonlinearities, there has been uh, work to do that. And so instead of just trying to get one joint vector where everything is smushed in, let's create a, a tensor or a, a, a 2D or 3D matrix that will explicitly model unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal interaction. So if you have two modalities, instead of joining them in one vector, let's join them in a matrix where you will have unimodal and the bimodal interactions are encoded in that same matrix, or we'll call it a tensor. And you could do that really nicely by just expanding HX and HY in such a way that you do have uh, each of them with a one underneath, which will nicely give you this uh, extended tensor. And what's really nice is you can do the same approach also for um, the trimodal case is visually, and, and it extends to other modality. It just becomes a little bit more complex as you increase more and more modalities. And that's why there was a nice little extension of that eventually to do this in a way that will scale. And that was uh, uh, by simply doing the composition of that tensor and now doing a rearrangement of the different factors. So this is a, just a, a quick uh, example of the kind of uh, approaches when you think multimodal. But I wanna emphasize the problem that we often have is that you have missing data. You often have missing data, either a whole modality is missing or um, because it was not recorded or certain words were too noisy or even not recorded or there was occlusion during a certain time. Uh, when you try to learn a representation by, by learning a representation, you want a representation that really uh, summarize 
all that has been observed, but also that representation should also summarize somehow the things that have been occluded. That's what you would like in the case of this. And the typical approach, as we talked earlier, was this encoder-decoder approach, um, where you simply uh, encode all three modalities in such a way that you get your joint representation, and that can greatly recreate all that has been observed. The problem with this, in doing it in this kind of feed-forward approach that is really popular because it's very efficient, one of the problem with this is that if you show to the input of that encoder very different version, you somehow the same, this very different input have to be mapped to the exact same input. And that is something hard for the encoder. And, and that puts a lot of pressure on the encoder to handle and, and fill the blank automatically. So to do instead of that is like, let's get rid of the encoder and just have a decoder. That's called variational auto decoder. And the idea here is that you will iteratively, so it's no more feed forward. It's no more like you train your variational auto encoder uh, on some training set and suddenly on test set, it's just feed forward. Here you have this extra cost uh, which is the iteratively, you're going to optimize given any new test set sample, you're going to optimize the decoder and the representation. While it gives a little bit more, require a little bit more computation, what's really good here is a lot more uh, robust to the data, to the missing data, because any new miss, any new data you give it, it's going to uh, re- um, re-optimize uh, it on it and, and try what it is trying to do is like try to recreate whatever you gave it. So the decoder will iteratively trying to find a probe that will allow it to recreate what has been both uh, has been observed and what has been not observed. And just to see it visually, what it means is that variational decoder given a new input you will, although this is where you know you should be if you have the ground truth, which means you know without the missing data where it looks like, that really the model doesn't know uh, where it is. So it randomly starts and it will iteratively optimize in such a way that it finds this uh, best representation. And what's really nice with this is that if you are uh, to uh, test it at test time, uh, what's really challenging is usually if at training time you have like 10% of missing data and at test time you have like suddenly 50% of missing data. This is something really hard for variational, variational auto decoder, uh, encoder, sorry, variational auto encoder and other approaches. But what, as we will see, the VAD, variational auto decoder, will perform better. So if you have a missing rate very different from the training rate, you would like, even though you would like it to not just be the diagonal, but you'd like the off diagonal to also work. But a typical variational auto encoder only work well if it's exactly the same as it has seen during training, while the variational auto decoder, the new algorithm, will be as long as a training it was. Uh, up to like 70% of missing, uh, only 70, but 70% is a lot of missing data. You only have 20, 30% of data that's not missed. And state of the art at that point was also the same as variational auto decoder. So I wanted to show you another example of, of going beyond just the multimodal and starting to think about robustness. Another example for the real world is the, is, is when we learn those representation, and let's say we're, we're learning uh, from data from the cell phone, maybe recognizing some aspect, uh, some, some information or some emotion, or maybe even from the cell phone, you'd like to pick up uh, cues related with mental health. Well, this is great because it could potentially help a lot of people to have this technology. It comes a really big price for privacy. And even though there has been work on federated learning, federated learning that says, oh, I'm going to learn when, but the data is never going to leave 
their cell phone or, or the computers. And really it's only parameters I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send only like the parameters which supposedly do not encode the person. But in reality, and we'll see that uh, in some late, at the end of the talk, these can uh, be identifiable. And I'm gonna show you an example of that at the end of the talk. Um, so that's one of the issue is like, you wanna be sure with privacy. And another aspect of trust is you want computers are able to say, I don't know. I, because I'm very scared these days with computers that are overconfident. And in a sense, it's good because when they succeed, they're great. But because they've been succeeding so often, when they fail, they fail miserably and they don't even know about it. And so I believe that moving forward, we want an algorithm to be able to abstain, to tell you, I would prefer to abstain, I don't know. So how do you train a model to say, I don't know? Because we know really well, if you offer this option to any kind of learning algorithm, they're gonna go there because that's gonna lower their loss function. So the idea is to take a, uh, analogy from the or from the theoretical work on the portfolio theory, which you could call the horse race gambling theory, if you wanted, is the idea of a balancing between betting on a horse, which you get a lot of reward, but also once in a while reserving your win and not losing anything. But if you don't, if you do it all the time, then you don't get any progress. And that was an example of uh, an algorithm being able to do the gambler, the, be using this gambling theory as a way to uh, model and uh, learn to abstain. Okay, I want to move towards uh, an, uh, another aspect, which is alignment. How do you align your modalities? So if you have language and you have an image, how do you align them together? Uh, or if you have my behavior right now and my gesture, how do you synchronize my gesture with my language? And to do that, it is useful sometimes to start with a relatively simpler problem. Uh, in this case, where you only have images and not video. Um, so for example, in this case, could you could imagine uh, an assistant and then the person asking, could you bring me my pills? This should be on top of the nightstand on the left of the bed. So the bed is there, the nightstand, and you find the pill on top of it. Or you could imagine, uh, let's, uh, as you give direction to a self-driving car, let's stop, park after the second intersection as soon as you find a free spot. So these are called referring expression because there is one place specifically or a few places specifically you're interested. And to a big aspect of it, like a big technical challenge is to align the language with the vision. So you have certain words that are aligned to certain objects in the image and you wanna learn what we'll call a grounding because the word will be grounded with their environment. And you wanna be able to ground not only the words, but also the relationship between the objects. So not only the objects should be grounded, but also their relationship should be grounded as well. And so how can we do all, how can we tr all trust that all grounding elements are properly modeled? And that's where you want this to be interpretable. That's another aspect of trust is having mod, uh, computer models that are, you know why they made that prediction and potentially if they made a mistake, why did they make that mistake? So when you look at this problem of grounding, instead of putting it all in a black box and just as the, the model automatically predict which object, we'd like to do it in an interpretable way. So the suggestion is let's take advantage of the natural structure in language, the syntactic structure, and use this to help us 
create an interpretable version of it. So we will identify all the nouns uh, in this case. And they give usually are more likely to be grounded in the image. And then from this, I use the other uh, as the other part of the sentence as these relationship, and that will allow you to create a nice graph, a graph, a computation graph where you have the bed, you have the nightstand and the pills, and then what is on the left of the bed? These objects, all these objects, are on the left of the bed, and then you merge with the nightstand, and then you say on top of the nightstand. These are all the object, and then specifically the pill on top of it. And so you can see a nice progression. And now we can see step by step what were the intermediate uh, reasoning happening into this. So we will call the target, the, the object we are interested in, and we'll call the other object the support object. And this whole approach would be based on the module network where you locate the objects your relation between them and you aggregate the information. And when you do this approach, which is called GroundNet, you not only perform well to find the object, like the target object, but because there was all these intermediate steps, you're also really strong in uh, being able to um, uh, predict the supporting object. And if you're interested in this, there's extension of this work to make it in a 3D environment where the steps uh, are the referring steps are multi-step instruction. So I invite you to, to look at these. The third one, the third aspect uh, uh, that I wanted to talk about today uh, is the challenge of fusion. How do you aggregate all this information in a temporal way? So if you have verbal, vocal, and visual, and you integrate this information over time. So he is great, a <laughs> uh, uh, great presenter. I don't know who wrote that. Um, but yeah, so uh, you want to be able to predict from that uh, to join this and be able to uh, predict the emotion uh, in this or the social signal or the mental health. And one uh, data set, if you're interested to work on fusion, uh, looking at multimodal fusion, I invite you to look at the MOSE data set. It's a little bit older data set, uh, but it is also a very large and allow students to start working on multimodal fusion and study them uh, relatively nicely and with a nice interface. But if you ask me, where is going in fusion? Where are we going and moving forward is social intelligence. How do we create AI that go beyond just recognizing sentiment and be able to recognize very hard uh, challenges like, uh, like social phenomena, like are people getting along? It, it, it's, it's a very challenging because you need to understand what everybody was doing in the video, how they interacted, what they are, are, are they generally connected? Um, what is the atmosphere in the room? Uh, you could also uh, look at insult, like insulted. That's a, a, challenge, a, a, a characteristic that we don't study or even person being brave. These are going beyond like basic emotion of happy, sad, uh, surprise, and really going to those other mental state and attitude. And how did the, mo the, the man show his discontent? Uh, was the person being rude? So these are examples. There's a nice extension to that uh, coming on soon. In fact, there's one version of it also in the car that, that, that will come relatively soon on this. Uh, for our people comfortable related to each other. And so how do you integrate all this video information together? How do you integrate it potentially to be able to uh, answer questions as the one I, I mentioned? In fact, it's a little bit equivalent to you guys listening to my talk. Um, 
you probably don't remember everything I said today. Uh, that would be probably preferable for you. Otherwise, that's too much information. Um, but you probably, there are a few things that you remember. And these are evidence, like local evidence. of, of uh, And you remember them. And then maybe later on, a new local evidence, a new thing you, you picked up on and you thought that was important. And you brought it back. Uh, and maybe you end up... Uh, aggregating and realizing that there's a link between what LP said 10 minutes ago and what he said now. Uh, and so you're making the link uh, at this point. And as a, as a small but a interesting way of, uh, of, of uh, replicating this phenomena, the memory fusion is, is one approach that was proposed where you want to locally aggregate evidences find what are important and you could imagine being a rolling uh, uh, a rolling window of local evidences and then memorizing and aggregating these local evidence so this is what's called the memory fusion network uh, and but there is also the importance of uh, being able to align not only uh, not only doing fusion, not only alignment and representation, but doing all three of them together. That is a challenge because when I speak, there are certain words that have an expression because of later. I do the gesture after or before. So the, the relationship, the alignment between words and their gesture and their emphasis is not always synchronized in time. There's this alignment. So I'd like to create a representation that uh, aggregate information or fuse information over time, do the alignment with long range dependency and be able to recognize that. And one approach to do this are the transformers as we know really well, these transformers are one approach and we've done plenty of work and there's been really nice work on multimodal transformers. And I invite you to uh, continue this line of research. But personally, I also like the idea of being able to uh, bring a, a, a little bit of domain knowledge into it. And also I wanna be able to be a little bit more interpretable. And so I personally believe that one great uh, extension of those fully connected self-attention transformers is to also look at those graph network as an alternative to that. These graph networks are uh, allow, if, when, if domain knowledge exists, you can put it there. So you could say, I don't know, maybe sentences should be aggregated together, for example, or you allow for different granular granularity for words, sentence, uh, for object or images. Uh, so that's one aspect. You can also align the same uh, advantage of the transformer is that you can handle the missed alignment and you can easily create them not just for one or two modalities, but also even three modalities and more. And the same advantage of transformer is that you have this long-term temporal dependency as long as you don't have too many edges uh, or otherwise you would need a lot of computation. Um, so the model temporal attention graph is this uh, example going in this direction where in this case, you will have your sentence and the video going with it and the audio and, and you'll have all of these uh, different evidences uh, coming from the text, from the video, from the audio, and you will locally encode them uh, as we will often do and maybe add to it a positional embedding as we do in transformers. Um, but you, what the, the key aspect here is the edge construction. And here, the edge construction will be done in such a way that you have both modal edges and temporal edges. So Model edges will model the relationship, the cross-modal interactions, which words are related to which acoustic phenomena or which uh, words are associated to visual behaviors. 
that's the modal one. And you will also allow for temporal, uh, which also means that you will be able to uh, model uh, long range dependencies as well. But as you can imagine, um, as you get the full graph, then it's almost a transformer. And then you will uh, iteratively combine the information and prune the information in some iterative or multi-layer way as a way to reduce and finally have a subset of that. And that will allow you to improve and not only improve performance uh, with like prediction, but also improve the, uh, the size of the model. So I showed you uh, um, uh, challenges with the focus on representations, joint representation, alignment, and the temporal fusion. We talk about efficiency, robustness, and trust. Um, I just wanted to share a few more examples. Um, I already talked about the deep gambler. Um, I want to also share that if you are interested in multimodal, um, I invite you uh, to uh, download the multi-bench data set. Uh, this is a new data set from last December. Um, this data set uh, was designed to have multiple domains in it and going beyond language and vision. I mean, this is great, but reality is that there's a lot more modalities and we need to also study those limited resource modalities as well. And to help with uh, new uh, researchers in this, we also um, uh, created, uh, we call it the multi-zoo uh, data uh, a library that implements some very recent algorithm in multimodal fusion in a, some standardized uh, uh, implementation. And what it allows you is to compare many approaches. Um, one thing that was really interesting is we, we have these 20 plus fusion algorithms that were proposed with very different tasks in mind. Um, and what was really interesting as a step where I, don't, I, I, I didn't put it in the slides is that although those 20 fusion algorithms was for different uh, data set, by standardizing them, we are suddenly allowed to try those 20 fusion algorithms on all the data sets that we had and found new state of the art on many data sets just because people not sharing between, because they think because they do language and vision that their algorithm will not be applicable to other modalities. And so they don't go and try beyond it. Um, one other aspect is that we want to be able to study the efficiency of it, like training speed, and also the robustness. So it's not just about performance, but you also want to look at efficiency and robustness when looking at it. As the last uh, piece and the last example I wanted to, and I hinted at earlier uh, when I talk about the gambler as an introduction for it, I said cell phones are becoming uh, more and more prominent they're a great source of information, but is also a great concern for privacy. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, there's a lot of work on trying to, 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 to build algorithms using data from a cell phone. And one very prominent approach that got a lot of momentum is called federated learning. And, and the idea was like, oh, I'm not gonna get the data out, but I'm gonna locally train and send not the data, I'm gonna send supposedly those non-identifiable uh, parameters of the model and send that uh, to the more centralized uh, learning algorithm. And that will be uh, fine tuning uh, the recognition. So maybe you wanna be able to look at markers like mood for mental health. Uh, in our case, we look at it for uh, societal ideations. Uh, this was a high risk population. Uh, this was under informed consent, uh, but there were teenagers with high risk for societal ideation. And we, we looked these uh, mood the, uh, recognizers, uh, mood detectors, and look at the last, uh, the last uh, layer. 
and doing a simple TSNE plot on it, we were, and then we put a color for each user. And this is what we got. And that's very scary because suddenly you can clearly see that although you could say, I don't know who is who because uh, maybe I don't see directly their face because these features are supposedly non-identifiable. But if you plot it, you can see that there is clearly clusters for different colors and which also means they, since these colors are different users, that they also the information about them is there. And that can probably explain how big companies are so good uh, with advertisements, uh, because although they're maybe uh, private, uh, supposedly, uh, they, they are able to cluster people very easily. So as a, a, a new and a step towards privacy preserving, we propose this selective additive learning where not only we try um, to recognize uh, them, but we also uh, hide identifiable information. So any, um, any dimension here that is also relevant to the identity of the person, so we will add another path in the network, anything, any dimension that's also good for these identity we will uh, put a lot of noise on these uh, and increase it dramatically. And we're still, although we're adding the noise, it turned out that performance is still good in some sense even better uh, for generalization. And then finally you get a more privacy preserving uh, representation. So uh, to summarize, I will say, uh, as we move forward, we need a lot of progress on core technical challenges like representation, alignment, fusion, translation, and co-learning. But we also want to think about real world challenges as well. Um, if you happen to be in CBPR in New Orleans uh, or at NACL in uh, NACL at uh, Seattle, um, we are doing a new tutorial on uh, multimodal machine learning um, this is a year into the work uh, where we're going to go beyond these and give even more details on this. Um, I was hoping to include some of those new results in this talk today, um, but um, we, we had to, uh, I had to change a path, uh, but you are very welcome if you are at the conference to see the next version uh, to that. Uh, and there's a, like, a lot of exciting uh, results and also some open problem to continue to think about. So merci beaucoup for your attention. Uh, welcome, uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for this really cool talk. Um, are there any questions in the room? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with one question. Um, <clears throat> So when you looked at the robustness and the performance of like across all these models, um, I saw that especially for the robustness, the MVAE, which is, I guess, the product of experts approach was pretty robust. Um, like, could you identify some model class or architecture that was like more robust than others? Or could you kind of get something out of this? Yes, um, we, we, we're right now following up on these uh, results. Um, but as you say exactly, um, these approaches, um, there are some that uh, are even stronger for robustness. Um, I, I should say, uh, the some of it, I think if I remember the acronym correctly, was uh, architecture search. Um, in fact, architecture search, uh, although slower, because it every time uh, our new problem, they, they will study all these different uh, fusion architectures. Um, they are turn out to be more robust, um, but effectively the performance not as good. So the expert as uh, uh, I, I think MVA was a multimodal uh, variational autoencoder. Um, I, I have to double check, but uh, 
Um, uh, so, so these approaches are, 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 are performing well, um, not as robust as some others, but they have a, a good trade-off here. Um, it, the problem is uh, usually also a little bit on performance, uh, although um, EF is early fusion. And, and by the way, early fusion should always be one of your, uh, uh, like a simple fit forward neural network um, because uh, they, they, they're fast to implement late fusion. Uh, this is multimodal transformer, uh, uh, CCA. Uh, I have to remember all the acronym um, TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow, no, sorry, TensorFusion. Um, so yeah, there is some, we've, there was no clear, clear um, um, like grouping. And that's why we're extending a little bit now to, to go a little bit in depth, because what we believe is that um, there's more than one factors like like why uh, uh, an algorithm is slower, for example, can be for very different reason. It could be because it takes a long time to, to, um, to converge, or it could be that there's so many hyperparameters. Um, so there can be different reasons. Similarly for robustness, we're trying to find out what are the uh, grouping, like is it uh, a certain class, like are they robust? to missing modalities or noise. Uh, some of them may be because they, they can do uh, in painting more than better than others, while some others may be just better at handling noise. So we, we need a lot more research. This is why, in fact, we personally think um, one of the technical challenge uh, in the new tutorial that we will give at CVPR and NACL is we call it quantification quantifying quantifying the internal mechanic of the model, but also uh, a better understanding the trade-offs. Like what if I use five modalities or, or only three modalities? What if I change uh, this representation, uh, visual representation over this other visual representation? All these trade-offs, we need to have good methodology to understand it. And also at the output level, of the model, you need to also quantify like the robustness as we talk about the privacy, all of the above. So, so make it uh, the internal mechanic, the trade-off of the input modalities and better understanding the output qualities are, for example, this is what we call quantification. And I think there's a lot more work uh, to be done there in understanding the internals uh, of these uh, models, yeah. Maybe one related question also to you've shown the, the deep gambler and you said that kind of in this model you have the option or the model has the option to kind of opt out to make a decision. Is that kind of based on some cutoff that you choose or is it also because you quantify uncertainty and then below some threshold it says no I'm not kind of qualified to make a decision here. Yeah, um, we, we've explored a wide range of approaches um, and I'd be happy to share some um, uh, papers on like more extensive exploration. And sometimes some simple ones can work like uh, you can effectively look uh, even the logit or like the, you can look at the uh, confidence um, that uh, if it's a probability at the end of, 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 of your softmax, you could sometime even look at that. But uh, in the case of the deep gambler, it was done slightly different, but simple in this, is that you have your, if it's a multi-label, you have your uh, possible label output. Um, and then you just add one more label, which is I abstain. You add one more label. I abstain. Now you don't observe it, so uh, uh, you don't observe when you should abstain. Um, and and as I mentioned, the deep gambler is that now the model has always this option of abstaining. And if you are not careful and you just I don't know put cross entropy or something like it, it could it, it could like it either ignore that label completely um, because it never appears. Or it could be always picking it because it's 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 like maybe the lowest uh, loss you will get. So that's why the deep gambler 
came in is like, it was a way to define a loss function that will encourage it sometime, uh, but not always. Uh, and that was the, the trade-off here that you have. And I think there was one or two hyperparameters that we, uh, for the deep gambler, as you can express, because um, like some people have a sense of risk a little bit more than others. Um, and so that, that hyperparameter, um, what we looked is found is that there's a way, it, it's not as sensitive as you would think. And so as long as you're in a good ballpark, it, it seemed to work fine. Um, so that was the idea here, which is a bit different from the other approaches which are still valuable uh, and sometimes a little bit simpler, but even the deep gambler, although it adds something on the loss, like the complexity of the model is almost the same. I mean, you just have one more label, which is almost nothing at test time. That's, that's very cool. So also like, since you kind of learn to predict whether the model abstains, you could also use some explainable AI techniques to say which features might be relevant or tell the model to kind of abstain, right? So. Ah, yeah, we didn't do that. But now these days you could like look at the gradient or something like this. Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. Cool. So any other questions here in the room? Yeah, we'll have to walk a bit. Thank you. Um, you told us, I think it was on one of the final slides, um, can you tell us a bit more about how you found out for the privacy setting, which data to exclude and how you exclude it? Yes. Um, and, and, and sorry, some of it, um, because of time, I didn't give as much details and uh, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to give more. So uh, the idea is um, we will train first the model the normal way um the normal way so uh so maybe you have all your input features uh, of different information um in our case i think we had keystroke like everything you type on the phone uh the app you open um we had gps but we didn't include in that exact experiment and you predict the mood which we had some um uh, proxy measure for the mood so you you train the model the usual way so then after that, what you would do is because you also have identity, you would create this one hot uh, vector um, and, and you will see uh, almost in a generative sense how, and, and you will create a, a model, uh, a, um, a network that connects to those same, um, uh, to the same variable, to the same dimension, and you see which one of these dimensions best predict uh, the identity. Uh, and whichever does predict really well, uh, you're going to end up putting noise on them, uh, additive noise. That's why it's called selective. You select the ones that have the most, uh, you could say, correlation with the identity not exactly correlation and then you add to it uh, the noise um there are other ways to do it uh, you could just have a second last term uh, that just say uh i don't want you to be good at predicting um what we like of this approach is that it's really simple because really you just in one of your layers usually one of your last layer you just add the noise there and that's it um so it kind of uh it's a little bit simpler uh, in that sense. Um, and since then, there's been uh, a little bit more work continuing that kind of research. But I think there's more to be done there. But the, the key idea was to find which dimension best predict the identity, as you could see, as a one hot vector, because we have this information from uh, it. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Um, just. A second time, so I understand correctly, um, you would then have to put the give the data, um, not, not handle it just on the phone, but have to send it somewhere else. Because if you just have one phone, you will be pretty hard pressed to find out what are the factors that go into determining the identity if you just have one identity on the phone. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yeah. So um, um, in, in this exact experiment, we uh, had it from um like different users i think we had the 80 different users yeah 
And so 80 different phones, yeah. It, it, was it your question or was it there? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, 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 sorry for, yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if that's not the case, then uh, thank you again that you joined in to give us this nice talk and yeah, we hope you have a nice day. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, really glad to hear the interest in multimodal and, and uh, really nice talking to everyone.